2 Timothy chapter number 4. I'll tell you where this lesson starts. We don't have time to go over and read all of it. In your free time or in your study, go read Isaiah chapter number 53. At verse number 3, it says that he was despised and rejected of men, that we esteemed him not. That's why he was despised. And I've always not liked, but I've always found that word despised interesting. Because nowadays, if you say you despise something, people think that it means you hate it. That's not what the word despise means. The word despise means that you don't think it has any value. Right? It's not that you hate it. You just think it's useless. That's what the word despise means. And keep that in mind as we read these verses today. 2 Timothy chapter number 4 Begin reading in verse number 16. The Apostle Paul wrote it. My first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will... Preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, the Apostle Paul had a very similar instance. For whatever reason, we could look at the differences on why Christ was despised and why the Apostle Paul was despised. Christ was despised because here's a fellow that comes from, if you're a student of the Bible, comes out of nowhere, right? He's a place, Nazareth, I mean, they even said, has any good thing ever come out of Nazareth, right? Comes out of nowhere, middle of nowhere. And they say, isn't he the carpenter's son? And they didn't understand that, no, he wasn't the carpenter's son, but at 12 years old, he leaves them slack jaw at the temple, explaining things from the word of God to them. And then 20 years later, they forget about him. It's as if he never existed. Right? He shows up. Why did they despise him? Because he was upsetting their apple cart. Right? He was upsetting the religious apple cart of the day. He was upsetting their societal apple cart. They didn't like if a man compels you to go with him a mile, go with him twain. That was societal. That wasn't religious, so to speak. Having to deal with the Pharisees, that was dealing with their day-to-day -day life. They were like, ooh, ooh, ooh. Hey, you talk about how you know bad the Pharisees are, the Sadducees. Talk about how bad Caesar is. We're okay with all of that. Just don't get to where we live, right? Well, the Apostle Paul, some thought that he was an infiltrator at first. He was the one who persecuted the church. They thought he was lying. Then, after a while, those doubts subsided. Then some people tried to stir up some enmity between Paul and the other 11 apostles. They had to come and sit down and say, hey, I've been out there preaching. This is what God told me. And then Peter and the other 11 are like, well, we've been preaching the same thing. And they were like, all right, then we're good. Tell everybody else to shut up. Right? How many other times, I mean, the apostle Paul wrote that some said that they were of Paul and some of Apollos and some of somebody else. People were making mountains out of molehills but for some reason, at the beginning, for whatever reason it was, people despised the Apostle Paul. They said, there's no value in that guy. Don't waste your time around him. Right, don't believe what he says. It's not worth a plug nickel. They said, don't go out with him on his mission journeys. It's all going to be for naught. Right? You're just going to be literally ruining, throwing your life away going with this fellow. Right? He was despised. And I'll tell you, it's a hard thing to be despised. If you're like me, you don't like feeling that somebody else thinks that you're worthless. Right? When I get on the job, right, as the Bible teaches, I'm to do all things as unto Christ. As if Christ himself was my boss, I'm supposed to do what the boss tells me to Christ's satisfaction. But I got a problem when somebody says, well, I didn't like the way that you did this. Well, one, if I did it wrong, tell me, because I want to do it right. But two, if I did it right, but I didn't do it to the degree that you thought that I ought to, tell me so that I can fix it. I got a problem with that. Right? You might call that pride, which it probably is. 
right? Never said I was perfect. But I like being able to take what I did for the day and find satisfaction in it. Right? I, I want other people to say, hey, I knew there was a reason we hired that guy. Right? I want to be the guy on the job that's known for fixing things. Right? That's basically what I do. I'm a fixer. Okay? Something breaks, I fix it. If somebody doesn't know what it is, I fix it. Right? I go figure out what it is so that it can be fixed. Right? That's what I do. I like fixing stuff. I like helping people. Right? But when you go through all of that effort, the worst thing is not that you did it the wrong. We can fix wrong. Right? You can be taught out of wrong. Right? If I don't know where to go, I can ask somebody that can teach me where to go. Right? But the one thing you can't fix is when you put all that time and effort into it, and then somebody comes back and says, oh, well, I wish you wouldn't have done this. It's useless. Right? Being despised. There's nothing worse than going out and spending time thinking, meditating, listening to what somebody says for a couple of months, trying to find somebody a good gift. And then they open it and they say, oh, I bought this last week. Because when you see that gift, you see all the time and effort and energy you put into it. When they see it, they see something that's useless because they already have it. They despise it. Right, Y'all picking up what I'm putting down now? Okay. Well, see, Christ was despised. He taught us that the world would hate us because they hated him. He told us that we have an adversary. The devil is a roaring lion. What's he do? He walks around, up and down, to and fro in the earth, seeking what? Whom he may devour. He wants your destruction. But see, you're okay with fighting the battle because you know who the enemy is. The Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. We think we understand what it is to battle against, you know, spiritual wickedness in high places, principalities, rulers of darkness. We have no idea if God were to pull the blinders off of our eyes. But... We have it in our mind that we know what it is to face an enemy toe-to-toe -to -toe on a battlefield, give it all that you've got, and trust that the Lord will make up the difference. You know why people are okay with putting on the whole armor of God? It's because they know they can do something about it. You know what the problem with being despised is? There's no enemy. Why are you despised? It could be a hundred things. It could be a thousand things. But here's the thing. You can't change somebody else's mind. I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with somebody, and I may lose, but I'm going to give it everything I've got. There's something I can do about that. But being despised, you are helpless to change the situation. Now, if Christ... According to John chapter number 1, is the Word. And in the beginning, the Word was with God. The Word was God. That without Him, nothing was made. That by Him and through Him do all things consist. The all-powerful Jehovah God didn't raise a finger to change somebody else's perspective on that He was worthless. Why would we expect Him to do the same thing for us? If Christ let people think He didn't have any value... Why would he intervene and keep people from thinking that you didn't have any value? Did he not say that we were to take up our cross and follow him? Part of what's in that cross is people despising you. People thinking that you're useless. And people don't know how to deal with it. Because there's nothing that they can do. You can't change somebody else's mind. I was an All-American debater in high school. I've got tons of trophies. Okay? Got a scholarship to go to college because I was that good at arguing with people. I know you can't change somebody else's mind that doesn't want to be changed. Doesn't matter how right you are. Doesn't matter how many statistics you have. Doesn't matter how many Bible verses you've got memorized to go out and to go after that person. Right? There are some people who have a hard heart. Go study Pharaoh. God made his heart harder every time through one of those plagues until eventually it broke. Moses didn't do a thing to change Moses, or Pharaoh's mind. All that Moses said, all that Moses prophesied would happen, none of that changed Pharaoh's mind. It was an act of God that broke Pharaoh's heart. 
And in truth, Pharaoh's mind wasn't changed. He got to the point that he was so desperate, he just told Moses to leave so that the problems would end. Right after the shock wore off of losing every firstborn in the nation of Egypt, what did he do? He sent his soldiers after him again to bring him back. He hadn't changed his mind. Right? Is it any wonder that the Bible talks about those that have had their conscience seared with a hot iron? You know what that means? Once it's been seared with a hot iron, you can't change it. You ever sear a steak? You ever try to unsear a steak? Can't be done. Once it's seared, it's seared. The inside of it may be raw, but the outside part that you seared, it can't ever be unseared after it's been seared. But the mind of somebody else is not your battlefield. But there are so many people that get lost fighting the battle of what other people's approval. They don't want to be despised. They want other people to feel like they have value, that they're worth something. Well, there's just a problem with that. There's going to be people in your life that despise you. And I truly believe that one of the snares of the devil, that the Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices, right? He's still using the same old tricks because they still work. But the Bible talks about those snares, the devices of the devil. One of them is other people's approval. See, God made us as people, people. Right? No man lives and dies unto himself. In fact, God, knowing that, said that you were to be an epistle known and read of all men, meaning that because you have interactions with other people, your life would be a Bible for other people off of what God put in you. We're meant to have interactions with others. Your spirituality as a Christian is dependent upon you going out and witnessing, being an ambassador for Christ. To be a billboard for this is what Christ has done in me. Right? That's natural to want to go out and to have connections with other people. It's unnatural for people that don't wish to be interconnected with it. Now, I'm not a people be. Ask Brother Randy, he and I, Brother Randy and I were very introverted. I know, right? Weird thing for the guy getting up and talking every day. I got no problem doing this because y'all don't talk back. Right? It's social interaction that wears me out. Right? Small talk is like nails against the chalkboard in my ears. I hate small talk. Right? I, if there's one thing I could undo in the world, it would be small talk. Let's get to business. What do you want? Right? I really don't care. Stop talking. Tell me what you need. But I can't say those things to people because apparently that's unacceptable social behavior. Okay? But see, there's a difference between being an introvert. What's that? It just means being around people wears you out. Right? People that are extroverted, they hang around people that get more energy. That's weird. Right? That doesn't make sense. Okay? It makes sense that you charge up batteries and then they get drained. It doesn't make sense that an empty battery charges itself. That doesn't make sense to me. Okay? But it makes sense to me that being around people wears me out. But I still do like being around other people. It's just sometimes I may be over on the side like, now nah, y'all go, go ahead. I'm recharging. Let me get another dive mountain dude. We'll be good. Okay, just give me a minute. Right? People that exclusively try to exclude themselves from the rest of the world, that's not biblical. That's a problem with your heart. Because according to the Bible, you're supposed to go out and have a heart for the things that Christ has a heart for, to have a burden for the things that... God has a burden for it. What are those burdens? Well, that every soul that's lost would be saved. Amen. How can you win anybody by avoiding them? Can't happen. Now, I know that there are situations where people are providentially hindered. And I'm not talking about people that are shut-ins or the people that can't go. But they still ought to have a heart to go out and to win those people. They, by faith, may stuff those track bags. They may pray over those tracks that go out, believing that somebody else will go in their stead, but they're still just as invested. They have a heart to go. They just don't have the ability to go. But somebody that has no desire for others, that's not biblical. Because if you're right with God, I do truly believe He'll burden you to go and win somebody. 
may not be on a mission field, maybe three streets over. But it'll give you a burden to see other people come to the saving knowledge of Christ. You have to go. You do realize that's the first word of the Great Commission. Go ye. You know who ye is? That's you. It's also me and it's everybody else that's ever been saved, but it's you. Amen. He told you to go. But when you go, I hate to tell you this, there's going to be a day when somebody despises you. The Apostle Paul had it from day one, he said. That at the beginning, at the very start of his ministry, he said, no man stood with me. Everybody thought he was useless. Everybody thought that he wasn't going to pan out to anything. Nobody thought that what he had to preach was worth hearing. That would have been one thing. Right? Peter stood up. Everybody thought he was just a dumb fisherman. But he stood up on the day of Pentecost, full of the Holy Ghost, and he started preaching. Well, people were listening. They preached in thousands, added to the church. Can you imagine? As the Apostle Paul getting up and preaching and nobody thinking that it was stop, worth to stop and hear what it was that he had to say. Nobody came up afterwards and said, hey, you said this. What, what does that mean when it comes to this, that, or the other? Who is this Jesus? Everybody thought what he had to say was useless. Had no value. But the Apostle Paul is talking about a place where he had nowhere that he could go to rely on anybody else, talking about people outwardly, because nobody thought it was worth hanging around him. It wasn't just that they ignored what he said, they avoided him like the plague. They thought that the Apostle Paul was going to be a black mark on Christianity. Oh, he's just weaseling his way in so that he can get more of us to admit that we believe in Jesus so he can go and persecute us. Even after he had changed his name, even after there were witnesses of those down in Damascus that he showed up blind saying that he saw Jesus and it took an act of God to take those scales off of his eyes and after that he just stuck around and he learned for a while. He got in. He got all the way in. In fact, that's the true story behind Barnabas going out with him on his first mission trip is that nobody else wanted to but Barnabas said he said he loves Jesus and I love Jesus and God said that I need to hook up with him he's going to knit our hearts together that was somebody saw somebody who had a need and said Lord just let me feel it and he went with him but see that snare of the devil is that too often, we care as much, if not more, what other people think about us rather than what God thinks about us. Look down in verse number 17. It says, Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. You know what that word notwithstanding means? Regardless of what I just said. What I just said did not keep God from doing what he did. But what did he say in verse 16? At my first answer, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. You know why the Apostle Paul's asking God to forgive them? Because he knew it made sense in the flesh. That's the guy that used to persecute us, that hanged out the warrants for us to be stoned. He held the coats of the men and stoned Stephen, one of the first deacons of the church. He said it made sense to him. You know what the Apostle Paul saying? If I was in their shoes, I don't know if I'd have been any different. But he says, regardless of who I was, where I came from, what other people thought, the justifications that they had to think that I was worthless, he said none of that kept God from being God. That's what notwithstanding means. He says, the Lord stood with me. Didn't say by me. Didn't say close to me. He said with me. You know what with means? They's hooked up. Couldn't separate them. If you're with somebody, it means that wherever they go, you go. It means that if they take a step to the left, you take a step to the left. The Apostle Paul didn't say that the Lord stood by me in those situations. No, he was there with me in the middle of it. 
Job's friends, when they showed up and tried to encourage him, right? But really, they showed up accusing Job, trying to figure out what it was that Job did, okay? Job's friends were by him, but they weren't with him. If they were with him, they'd have cared about Job more than what Job did or didn't do. If they were with him, they would have tried to help bear the burden. Doesn't Peter, just a few books later, right, cast all your cares upon him because he cares for you? You know why the Lord's able to prom give you that promise? Because he's with you. You can't cast something to a place that you can't see or that you're not at. He says, cast your cares upon me. You know why he said that? Because you can always find him. He's right there with you. He says, just cast it on me. Get rid of it. The Apostle Paul said, the Lord was with me. Not that he was in front of me and I was trying to catch up to him. No, every step of the way, he's, he was with me. Amen. You know that God doesn't stand next to, he's not with those that aren't with him. That's the result of draw nigh unto him and he'll draw nigh unto you. You know how close God will get? As close as you let him. And you know what the fact that the Lord said he was with the Apostle Paul? You know what that tells me? The Apostle Paul is in the perfect will of God. Because if he wasn't, the Lord wouldn't have been with him. The Lord would have been back at the Father's house and Paul would have been somewhere else. You do realize in the story of the prodigal son, the father never left the father's house. The son had to get back to the edge of the father's property before the father could get to him. Because the father doesn't leave the father's house. But the apostle Paul said, he was always with me. You know what that means? He's at the father's house. Everywhere you go at the father's house, the father can be with you. That's how I know that the apostle Paul knew he was in the perfect will of God. And in fact, look at verse number 18. It says, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. You know what that sounds like to me? People forsaking you and people despising you. It's not a good time. The Apostle Paul refers to it as an evil work. This isn't the only one, but he says, God will preserve me. He'll keep me from falling to all them evil works. Right? It's a machination of the devil to make you feel like you're worthless. Because here's what a lot of people growing up in communities and suburbs and everything else. Way back in the day, right, if you lived to be 12, there was like a chance that half of your kids or half of your brothers and sisters are already dead. Right? Your dad probably got mauled by a bear out in the woods. Okay? He might have one hand. Okay, and a whole bunch of scars. Right? By the time you got up to about 13, you had to learn how to do on your own. Right? It didn't matter what other people thought because people weren't out there with you in the middle of the wilderness going out and trying to find rabbits or water or whatever it was that you was looking for. Okay, people were resilient back then. Nowadays, we all got electricity and air conditioning. We live in nice communities where if the neighbor gets too loud, we call and complain to the cops because we think that the air belongs to us and we get to control the volume, right? People have become herd beings. We're used to being around people, okay? You know what's creepy? Drive the normal route that you normally do, but at like 2 a.m. It'll freak you out not seeing traffic because you're used to it. It'll mess with your head to sit at a red light when there's nobody coming in the other direction. You're not used to that. Why? You're used to being close. You're used to feeling like you're a part of something. But here's the criticism. Instead of making our associations known with the kingdom of heaven, we care just as much or more about being associated with those around us in the world. Now see, I thought that the Bible says to come out and be separate. A chosen generation, a royal priesthood. We're in the world, but not of the world. That our citizenship is recorded in a different land. Now, you can be a part of a community. You can be a part of a parent-teacher association, or PTO, now they call them orgs, I don't know. 
or they used to. I don't know, it's been a while since I've heard the phrase. I haven't been to school in a while. But you can be involved in your community. That's what the Bible teaches. You're supposed to be a part. How else are you going to be able to impact people? And if it's important to you, it's important to God. But see, when you start thinking that that approval is more important than God's approval, then you're left in a place where the world despises you because of what you've proclaimed, because of what you've lived and how you live it. And now the Lord is no longer with you because you've left Him. You're in no man's land. Do you know where no man's land is? It's a place where people don't come back from. No man can walk that land on their own and come out the same. Where do you think that the devil waits for people? You think it's at the Father's house? You think it's out in the world? No. It's no man's land. Because if they're already out in the world, they're not a problem. They've already ruined their testimony. But in no man's land, they've still got a chance to get back to the Father's house. What's he trying to do? Cripple them. Look at the end of verse number 17 at the end of it, it says and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion but Jordan how can you say that people despising you is something that the devil can do well who is our adversary the devil as a roaring lion and what did the apostle Paul say he said all men forsook me nobody was there with me God was but it says and God gave me the ability to go out and to preach to the Gentiles and then after that, he says, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. The devil was trying to get the Apostle Paul before the Apostle Paul's ministry ever took off. The devil knew that there's going to be a twelfth apostle. And he knew that it wasn't the guy that the other eleven picked as the twelfth apostle. He said, I'm trying to get rid of that guy because that's the one that God's going to have his hand on. So what did he do? He tried to put him on an island. That's just one problem. If you're right with God, you can never go anywhere and be alone. Amen. Now see, if you're not right with God, you can't go anywhere without Him if you're saved because He indwells you. That's not what I said. If you're backslidden, God still goes everywhere with you. But that doesn't mean that He's with you. He's still there. He's observing. He's the one that's going to hit you with the chastening rod. But see, if you're in the will of God, you can never go anywhere and be alone, is what I said. If you're in the will of God, you'll always have fellowship with Him. They did not say, verse number 17, notwithstanding the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. He does better than just being there. He's everything you need. You know why most people don't understand how resilient they really are? Because they've never been tested. You do realize that that's what trials are in the Bible. I thought on this, I don't know how many years ago now. But you know why people back in the day used to bite on gold coins? Because gold's soft enough that you can dent it with your teeth. You know what fake gold is? It's hard. You can't dent it with your teeth. Now you say, well, didn't he deform it? It's still gold. still worth something. Doesn't matter what it looks like. All that matters is whether it's gold or whether it's not gold. But what do you have to do? You have to put it through a trial to test it. That was an easy one. You know how anything that you buy to determine if it was worth the money, you got to put it through a trial. You got to use it. You've got to put it up against what it's expected to do and see if it does it or not. Doesn't do you any good to buy a hammer and then never hit a nail with it. That's what it was designed to do. But see, it's not just hitting a nail with it. Everybody knows that hammers hits nails. It's how many nails can it hit before it starts showing cracks. How long can it be used before the handle starts getting loose? And see, here's the thing. Our life... We're nothing special. We know we're just clay that God breathed life into. 
right? That on our own, it, we'd have been sin cursed and on our way to hell. Probably there already, but by the grace of God. And the world still sees us as that. Why? Because we look like them. Right? We may not say the same things that they do, but we talk the same language. Okay? We wear the same style of clothing. We drive the same kind of cars. We work the same kind of jobs. They think that we're just nothing special. That's why they despise you. Because they don't think that they're worth anything. They can tell you otherwise, but when they go home and they lay their head on their pillow at night, they're not satisfied with who they are. Because there's a hole in their soul that tells them that they need something. They just don't know what it is. They're never satisfied. And they think that they're not enough. So they try to tear other people down and make them feel like they're better. They despise you because they, you're just like me. How could there be anything special about you? Well, see, when God takes something that looks on the outside, it's just an earthen vessel. It looks exactly like theirs. They look at it and they say, there's nothing special about it. Well, doesn't the Bible say that one of the great mysteries is why God would choose to take a heavenly treasure, which is his son, and hide it in earthen vessels? It's so that he can put us through trials and they can throw whatever they have at us as hard as they can, as hot as they can, as long as they can stand it. We've got to be used to prove that what's in us is different and what's in them. In order to pass the trial, you have to accept the fact that it doesn't matter what other people think about you. You may find yourself in a cave like David... But the Lord may allow it to where you don't have those mighty men that come out to follow after you, like we heard about last Sunday night. It may just be you in a cave because everybody else has despised you. All men have forsaken you. The devil gets you to a place where you think you're alone. You've got to be able to understand and rely upon the greatest relationship that you have. What's that? That's with him. Because as long as you're still in His will, He's with you. He will strengthen you on the authority of God's Word. But so many people give up before the trial even starts. Because they care more about what other people say. They want to be a part. They want to get back to where they were. And they'll give up whatever standards it takes as long as you let me go back and do the things that I used to do. Well, when it comes to trials, you do, anybody ever watch racing where they do them things called time trials? Right, hot laps is what they call them in NASCAR. You go out and you try to do the fastest thing you can. But you ever notice that when they do those things, there's only one person on the racetrack? That's to keep everybody else from getting in the way. It's just them versus whatever they're facing and all eyes are watching them see how they handle the situation that everybody else has had to handle who handled it the best because right, that guy gets to start the race in first place he did the best job he gets to go out there in front part of a trial is that you are separated from everybody else because God puts you through it while everybody else is watching Now, I know that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael, whichever names you want to use, I know that they're thrown into the fiery furnace as a group. But you do realize that throughout that story, all of them individually said, I'm not going to bow. They made it personal. They said, nope, even if these two give up, I'm not giving up. Then eventually it turns into we because they all say, we're not bound. And they say, well, if we're not bound, we're a group now. But they were classified as one group. Who were they? They were the disobedient. They were the mockers, the scorners, the ones that wouldn't bow down to the statue of, quote-unquote, God, even though it looked just like the king. He said, throw them in the fire. You know who was watching? Everybody. They were set aside. They were put on a pedestal and the king tried to smack him with a hammer. There was just a problem. 
You can't dent diamonds with hammers. The reason that you find the true value of something is when you test how resilient it really is. You know why trucks? Well, part of it is because is we got a whole bunch of rednecks and everybody wants one. That's one of the reasons that trucks are as expensive as they are. But you know why generally work trucks are more expensive than cars? Because they're expected to last longer. They're supposed to be durable. You're supposed to be able to throw a whole bunch of tools in the back and drive around on the off-road and then still be able to pull it onto the blacktop and make it back home. It's supposed to have that built into it. Okay, that's why... Ford, whether or not it's true, what do they always say? Built Ford Duff, right? On the F-150s, all their trucks. They're saying, we've got a pattern. That's why we charge as much as we do. If they didn't last, they wouldn't cost as much because people wouldn't pay it. wouldn't be worth it. You do realize that your life is meant to be a testimony in line with this book Amen. that says, forsake everything in the world because Christ is worth it. That's what your life is supposed to say. Because that's what he said. He told people, leave it all, follow me. He says, either God's worth it, or what you have in your life is more important to you than God. That's the testimony that we're supposed to have. You can't have that testimony if you aren't prepared to be despised by those people around you. And I've got news for you the people that are closest to you. Their declaration that they don't think that you're of any value, those are the ones that hurt the most. Because you're most compassionate about them. You are most attached to those people. But I'll remind you that the Bible says a prophet is not without honor except where? In his own country. You've got to be willing to embrace the fact that people think there's no value in you because until you do, God can't prove that there is something valuable in you. If you're always seeking the approval or the value of others, God can't prove that what's in you is more important than the approval of others. That what you have is more valuable than the approval of others. That what you have can satisfy you when everybody forsakes you. You don't need anyone because you have the one, Him. It says, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. Those are future tense. You know why the Apostle Paul knows it to be true? Because God promised him he'd do it before and he did it before. And the Apostle Paul believes that if God didn't want him to be preserved, that he wouldn't have preserved him then. That if he didn't want him to be delivered, he wouldn't have delivered him before. Christ did not save you so that you could be destroyed. Christ saved you so that he could use you as a vessel of honor to bring attention to his son. You don't break vessels of honor. You don't throw out vessels of honor. If a vessel of honor gets damaged, you know what you do? You repair it to get it back to what it was. A vessel of honor is something that you put on display. You know how the world knows that you're honorable in the service of God, that you have value to your God? Because God only uses the things that he trusts in the hardest situations. You ask Brother Ray. Brother Ray used to build houses. But Brother Ray's done everything. But Brother Ray knows the construction business and the construction industry. He used to climb up and hang off the sides of them skyscrapers down in downtown Cincinnati. Now you ask him, I haven't asked him, but I know what the answer is going to be. If you know that you're getting ready to swing over the side of a building, that means you can't take your toolbox with you. And if you're like a man, any man, you've got 900 of the same tool in four different toolboxes, Right? Which tool are you taking up on the side of that the one that you got the most trust in? Because you don't have the option to say, hey, can you hand me that? You're hanging off the side of a building. 
right? It's inconvenient to go all the way back up the side of the building, back down to the truck, in order to get what it is that you originally wanted to use. What are you taking up there? The things that you trust, that you know are going to get the job done. Even if it may not be the right tool for the job, you know what that thing can do because you've used it to do a whole bunch of things. But it's amazing what you can do with a flathead screwdriver besides screwing screws. Okay? It's amazing what you can do with an adjustable wrench that has nothing to do with loosening or tightening. Every now and then you just need something that you can beat on something until it comes loose. Right, sometimes you've just got a PVC pipe. You know what that's called? A breaker bar. Extra torque. Why in the world are you carrying around that PVC pipe? There's no value in that. Just wait. One of these days we're going to hit a bolt that you can't loosen. That sucker's going to come in handy. What do you take up in the most precarious situations where it matters that you get it done the right the first time? It's the tool that you can trust. You know what God's asking you to do? He's saying, let me put you on an island for a time. Didn't stay that way. The Apostle Paul said that he was delivered from the mouth of the lion. You know what that means? God took away that snare, and then he's the Apostle Paul that we read about. Where he has contacts all over minor Asia. He's got people that are supplying and sending to meet his needs. He's got people that are coming out and leaving their mission field to come and support him. Who do you think Luke and Timothy were? Go read about the helpers of the Apostle Paul. The Lord rewarded his faithfulness. And he knit his heart together with so many others. But he said, for a time, let me put you over here on your own so that I can prove your value to those around you. Do you know why the Apostle Paul was able to win so many Gentiles? Because he was willing to be put on the outside and poked and prodded by the world to see what it was that was inside of him that was different than what was inside of them. The Apostle Paul said, I've got nothing to hide. He says, I know my past. That man's dead. You want to ask me questions? Saul's dead. I'm Paul. God did a change in me. Amen. Well, how do they prove that? They're going to get up and they're going to start poking him, seeing what's inside. Well, if we say this, does he say he's going to arrest us? If we say this, or if we, you know, correct what it was that the Pharisees said, is he going to get irate and angry with us? He was put in an observation booth. And the world threw everything that they could at him. And you know what he said? Notwithstanding, the Lord was with me. And he strengthened me. Truth is, most Christians don't know how strong they can be in the Lord because they've never gotten to the point where they've had to rely on the Lord's strength. They trust in what they can see and they trust in the arm of flesh. They never trust in faith and the strength of our God. You know why people took note of the Apostle Paul? Because they knew he's not strong enough to do that on his own because he's like us. We wouldn't be able to do that so how'd he be able to do that? Then that's when the Apostle Paul says, it's not my strength, it's his strength. I'll remind you that this is the same fellow that said his strength, the Lord's strength, is made perfect in weakness. Our weakness. He said, I'm as weak as you are. The weaker I get, the stronger God gets. How did the people around him find proof of what it was that the Apostle Paul believed unless God put him out there through all the trials through all the ridicule through all the rejection the more that they stripped away of the Apostle Paul the more Jesus got to shine through the more the paint that the world had put on him got scraped off the more Jesus was able to be seen if you don't embrace the fact that some people are just going to think that you're not worth their time you're not worth their energy it may not be God's will for you to reach that person if you get caught up on trying to win the approval of somebody that it takes an act of God for them to change their mind 
you're going to miss the one that's looking for somebody that has the answer. The Apostle Paul didn't focus on all those that didn't think it was worth anything. He focused on those that saw value in Jesus. He was looking for people with hungry eyes to tell us more about Jesus. You know who Christ focused on? Those that had a need. Knew that they were needy. And were willing to hear where the answer for their need could come from. Never once did Christ go to somebody that didn't know that they were a sinner. That didn't know that they needed the Lord. That didn't know that they weren't enough on their own to take care of their current situation. There were many that came to him that thought they were enough and they went away angry or disappointed. Why? Because they weren't needy. Get your eyes off of those that tell you you're useless and look for those that are looking for something that's true, that's real. That's who Christ focused on. Why was he the friend of publicans and sinners? Because they knew who they were. Everybody knew who they were. They were the dregs of society. They were about this far away from being kicked out of town. But yet what did he do? He sat down and he broke bread with them. He was a friend to them. Why? Because they weren't looking at what was on the outside. They saw what was in him. And that's what allowed the Lord to speak to their need because they weren't worried about how he was dressed. It took the woman at the well a little bit. But eventually she saw past who he was and started listening to what? What he said. Those that are needy are always looking for an answer of how that need can be met. The people that think that you don't have any value, they're not needy yet. When they are needy, God may send you back. God may send somebody else. But we're to go to the highways and the hedges looking for those that know they have a problem. You can't convince somebody that they're a sinner. That takes an act of God. That's called conviction. That's the job of the Holy Ghost. You know what your job is? To go out and shine. Be the light of the world. Be the salt of the earth. Yes. It's your job to go out and to be tested and tried and set aside from the world. Who cares what the world thinks of you? God thought that you were worth His only begotten Son. Amen. He's put you in a church body, fitly framed us together as one body in Christ. Why? So that we see the value in others, each other. We're to bear one another's burdens. Why? Because I see the value in you. I see your importance to what it is that God's doing around here. Because without you, we're not the church. It takes everybody. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.